Okay, so now that you got your brace off, um, we went ahead, we loosened all of the nuts on the main studs. Um, then we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna loosen the stud. Um, for me personally, I like to maintain the position of each stud in the location it came out of. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna remove the whole stud and nut combination. And then we're gonna place it. So if this is the front, we're gonna start from the front and we're gonna make that front left. So if you're looking at it like this, front left, front right, and we're gonna keep going like that. We're gonna lay them out. The reason I keep the nut and the washer on there is so you're not laying out nuts, washers, and everything all separately, and it doesn't get too confusing. Um, and then also this makes your life a lot easier to disassemble and then reassemble it's already together. You put your lubrication back on, and then you slap the stud in, torque them down again. It saves a little bit of time. Okay, so once you have all your main studs out, um, you got them lined up in the position they were in. Um, you can see I have them laid out here. You're gonna take two pry bars to safely remove the, the girdle here plate. I recommend using two just so you don't break it. Um, it does seem like uh, it's a very st strong and, and sturdy piece. Um, we've gone ahead, we've machined it flat for the brace, so it makes it a little bit thin in these areas and it can break. And then once you have it uh, popped off, you can just go ahead and remove it. Now that we have the uh, girdle off, the brace off, uh, we're gonna start fitting our block for uh, the main bearings. A um, Couple things we have to do first. Um, first off, obviously we're gonna want to clean them. Um, so again, we use 99.9% .9 isopropyl alcohol. Um, it cleans and it completely dries away. It doesn't leave any residue on the bearings that can uh, mess with your clearances um, or cause any issues elsewhere um, as far as damaging the bearing or leaving residue on it. We have to use, again, clean microfiber so it doesn't, uh, it's a, a lint-free almost cloth is the, the way you'd call it, I guess. Um, and then we're just gonna wet the rag and then wipe the bearing off and then set it back with the rest and then move on to the next one. You're gonna always wanna make sure that uh, you're changing your gloves. Um, if you have been touching something dirty like the ARP lube or even the metal components themselves, new gloves for this part is always recommended. Um, and then if you can clean the glove, great. If not, always replace it, just like a doctor. You wanna be as clean as possible. I also don't recommend doing this with bare hands because the oils on your skin will leave residue on the bearing as well. Um, so just make sure you wear a glove of some kind. Uh, just to make sure that you're cleaning the bearing completely. Might just be a little uh, over the top, but I always try to maintain a, a level of consistency when uh, doing something like this. Okay, so now we're gonna measure our bearings themselves um, for consistent thickness. Um, so we have a little uh, micrometer attachment tool here, a little ball inside of a rubber cap. Um, so we go ahead and put that on the end of the micrometer here. And that kind of allows you to measure an inside curve. Um, so you're able to get inside the bearing and measure the, uh, the thickness of it. Um, so once we have that installed, you have to go ahead and you have to zero our tool. So once you have it zeroed with the ball in there, um, you can go ahead and you can start your measurements. Again, with anything, um, when you re-zero it, make sure you do a couple of tests, make sure it hits zero every time. You want repeatability again um, to ensure good accuracy. Um, so once you've done that a couple of times, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna start measuring the thickness of the shells. So you just go ahead and you measure a certain point, usually the center in the bottom. Um, just try to find a base measurement so we're starting with uh, 1.829. And then we'll just measure for taper. So for taper, we're looking for, again, less than two tenths. Um, zero would be ideal, of course, um, but there is a, a bit of a coating on here, so it does tend to vary. Um, again, minimum or maximum allowed usually is uh, two ten thousandths. Okay, so once you've checked um, for the taper on the bearing, um, this one's pretty good. Um, I'm not getting a measurable difference. Um, this micrometer only goes down to uh, the thousands of an inch. Um, so as long as you're not getting any variance, you should be okay. Um, one thing to note, the bearing has a uh, uh, eccentricity built into it. Um, so the thickness here versus at the top here is gonna be thinner and same on this side. Um, so if you go and you measure out, I think about 4,000 to 5,000 eccentricity is usually built into the bearing. We'll talk more about that when we install it into the engine block. Um, but now that we've uh, gone ahead and we verified this one, we can go ahead and install it. We're gonna repeat the process for all of them. Uh, one thing to note when you're measuring your shell, this is kind of just a, uh, an extra step um, before you go ahead and waste your time installing the shell. You can kind of check and make sure it's good. Um, obviously, once you install the shell in the block, once you've measured your main line, if you see a variance in the, in the um, taper from the block to the shell, you know it's probably the shell, um, top or bottom. Um, so you can go ahead and you can take it out again and obviously measure top and bottom, see where the problem is. Um, but this is just an extra step to confirm um, that the uh, thickness of the shell is exactly what it should be before you go ahead and put it in. Just a bit of a time saver uh, in the end. 
Um, the variance of thickness from shelf to shelf um, is also going to be a factor. Um, typically, one thou is the allowable limit. Um, you'll notice that uh, obviously you want to have um, variance from shell to shell under one thou, but uh, you want the variance on the shell to be under two tenths. Um, so that's just from uh, inner to outer. Um, for the RB26, this uh, block shell obviously doesn't have a center section. You can't measure the middle of it, so you're measuring the one side and the other side. Um, so you're just making sure the thickness is the same um, from one side to the other. Okay, so now that you have your bearings clean, we're going to go ahead and we're going to start installing them into the block side. Um, when uh, you're going to install the bearings, feel free to give the uh, main journals another wipe of uh, isopropyl alcohol, make sure it's really clean. And then when you're done that, I always like to give it one more wipe with a clean glove, just to make sure there's no fuzz or anything from a rag. Um, I know it's a lint-free rag, but uh, sometimes you do get a little bit of debris on there. Give it a wipe. The rubber glove is not going to have any debris on it, so you can clearly see if you've got a good wipe on it. Um, and then it should be clean and dry, and we can go ahead and we can start installing our shells. Um, these are already clean, ready to go. Um, it's good to make sure that the main journal uh, inside the block is clean because if this measures out okay, I will leave them in the block and we wouldn't have to remove them again. So obviously you're going to take the uh, alignment tang. Um, all this does is align it. It doesn't do anything to hold it in the bore. Um, the bearing crush is what holds the bearing in place. Um, so you take your alignment tang, install it, press it down into position, and then just double check. Oops. And then the last bearing you install is the, uh, the thrust bearing. Um, the thrust bearing just goes in the middle again, line up the alignment tang. There we are. Beauty. Okay, now we can go ahead, we can cover this engine up and we'll go ahead and install the bearings into the uh, girdle. Okay, next step, again, um, just take a, a thumb across the surface of the main journal, wipe it off, see if there's any debris on there. Now you can go ahead and you can install your shell. Same thing, alignment dowel or alignment tang. Slide it into position. Okay, so uh, one thing to note, obvious, um, it's so obvious I didn't mention it originally. Um, obviously the ones with the oil holes go inside the block uh, where the oil feed comes from. And the smooth ones go on the bottom, um, which is when it's the other way around on the bottom. So now that we have our main shells installed, uh, we can go ahead and we can place the uh, girdle back on the block. And then you can go ahead and you can place your main studs back into the same homes that they were in. Once you get all your main studs popped back in, you can go ahead and tighten them all down. Uh, make sure the nuts are high enough up that they don't uh, trick you in thinking that they're tight when they're actually just hitting the uh, the girdle. So you can go ahead and you can loosen these up a little bit, tighten down your main studs again, only hand tight. Um, and then we'll move on to uh, tightening the nuts down to uh, put the girdle down, or to uh, press the girdle down. Once you have all your studs tight, same thing as before, you're just going to want to walk it down, starting in the middle and working your way outward. Um, so once you get your bearings reinstalled, you cinch down the uh, girdle, and you go ahead, 60 foot-pounds divided by three, so we'll start with 20, 40, 60, and then again, middle out, um, crisscross pattern. Okay, so, uh, when we last left off here, um, we installed our uh, main bearings into our engine here. Um, so we're going to move on to, oh, arm, arm. We're going to move on to, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to do my best not to say um too much because some people don't like it. Uh, switch it up to the ah. Uh. We installed the main bearings. Now we're going to go ahead, we're going to uh, wipe down our crank here and then we're going to start measuring our main journals. Once we're done recording on the sheet, we're going to go ahead, we're going to set our bore gauge. We're going to start measuring uh, the line bore of the block with the bearings installed. Now that we've got our crankshaft cleaned, once again, you want to go ahead, um, zero out your micrometer. Um, well, we've already done this, so we're just going to go ahead and start measuring. Okay, so now that we're going to be measuring the crankshaft mains, um, the specification that we're going to be looking for is going to be uh, with a two inch to three inch micrometer, you're going to be looking for a 2.16380. 
uh, on your micrometer it might only go down four decimal places too so two point or uh, yeah 2.1638 will probably be the specification that you'll go for uh, so we're expecting to see that across all of them plus or minus two tenths again the specification for a crankshaft is as close as possible to zero obviously but maximum allowable limit for out of round on the crankshaft or taper on the crankshaft is going to be two ten thousandths of an inch our first measurement is uh, 1.6380. So we're gonna consider that our base measurement, just like we would do with the out of round on the main journal, we're gonna use this as our base measurement. We're gonna check multiple locations in the same journal and see what kind of out of round of taper we have uh, and then decide if this crankshaft is good. Um, this one is brand new from Nissan. Uh, it does not have any machining done to it at all. So the uh, condition of this is um, exactly how I'd receive it from the Nissan manufacturer. Okay, so our first measurement is just gonna be in the center. We're gonna go 90 degrees to the oil journal holes, which is just these two holes on each side here. And then we're gonna go almost 90, not right on the oil journal holes, but as close as possible. And then we're just gonna go to the center. And this measurement it out as well at 90 degrees. 1.6380. So we're zero, zero there, as far as uh, out of round is concerned. Uh, with two measurements so we'll go ahead we'll check a couple more locations and see if you suspect that the crankshaft is out of round after you do probably two or three measurements um, you'll probably know by now if there's any problems so now that we've measured for out of round we're going to go for taper we're going to bring it up to the end One point six three eight five. that's about a half ten thousandths of an inch of taper that is well within our allowable limit and then we're gonna bring it back to the inside. A little bit tricky, you gotta make sure your tool is not contacting the counterweight on the crankshaft or you will skew your measurement. So bring it as close as possible to one side. And again, 0.16385, half ten thousandths of an inch out of round or tapered, sorry. And then we're gonna repeat the same process for all the journals. Again, as you get into the middle of the crankshaft, it's gonna be harder and harder to measure for taper, so you kinda of have to position the tool um, inner or outer of the location that you're measuring. Obviously, it's gonna get harder to measure taper towards the edges as you move along. If you have a fully counterweighted crankshaft, it gets a little bit more tricky, um, so you do have to kind of position the tool in the right location. Usually, you'll get a good idea if the crankshaft is good or not, just based off a couple of measurements. Um, if it's bad, there's not usually lucky two good spots. You'll usually find a couple of bad spots right off the hop. Okay, so now that we've gone through, we've measured our entire crankshaft, verified there's no issues there. We're gonna go ahead, we're gonna measure each journal now again, and we're gonna compare our measurement from this to that and see what kind of oil claims we have. And that will decide uh, what we have to do with the bearings, if anything at all, and we'll go from there. Okay, so now that we've measured our journal, we're just gonna do number one for now. We go ahead and we're gonna center this into the uh, micrometer, which is set to the outside diameter of our journal. Then we're gonna go ahead and measure our oil clearance inside the main journal with the bearing installed. So once you have your uh, bore gauge centered or uh, zeroed out inside your micrometer, you go ahead and install it in your first journal here. Okay, so we're gonna get about a 1.1 thou oil clearance with the standard ACL bearings installed. Um, this is gonna be a little bit tight for our comfort zone. So we're probably gonna go ahead, we're gonna switch these for the 1 thou extra ACL main bearings. So now we've measured the first one. Um, because our journal size that we measured before is all the same, because our, uh, sorry, because our crank journal size is all the same, because we know our main journal size is all the same, and the uh, main bearings uh, on the first one are measuring out as 1.1 thou. 11 10 thou, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's not going to be okay for the type of setup that we're going to be running. Um, so we're going to need to install a plus 1 thou oil clearance um, main bearing into this engine. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to remove these bearings, we're going to set them aside, and we're going to install our plus 1 thou um, HX, which is what ACL calls them, uh, oil bearings, or uh, main bearings, and these will allow us to have plus 1 thou oil clearance, and that should set us about 2.1, which is about what we're hoping to get out of this engine um, as a minimum oil clearance. Now that we have our new plus 1 thou um, main bearings in from ACL, uh, we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna measure our oil clearance again. Um, so we set our uh, bore gauge uh, in the micrometer to this o uh, outside dimension, uh, and we're gonna go and we're gonna measure these again. 
right about two thou. Two thou on that one as well. So that's a lot better than the one, 1 1.1 1 thou, 11 ten thou, um, however you want to say it. Technically it's not 1.1, 1 .1, it's, it's 11 ten thou, um, or 1 1 thou. Um, now that we've done those ones, we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna measure or set our uh, micrometer to each um, dimension for each journal inside the crank. So we're gonna start from one, two, work our way all the way back to seven, and then measure each journal uh, inside diameter and uh, figure out what our oil clearance is for each one, and we'll record that on our uh, blueprint sheet. Okay, so again, when you're measuring your oil clearance, it's always gonna be vertical, top to bottom. Um, when you're measuring, uh, you're always, obviously the bearing is uh, a little bit of an oil groove in the middle, so you're gonna have to measure towards the front side and towards the rear side when you're measuring. So you're first gonna measure here, and that is the tooth out we already measured, and then you're gonna to wanna to move it back, and that is also tooth out that we already measured. And then after that, you're gonna to wanna to check your bearing eccentricity. Uh, the eccentricity is the egg shape that's built into any um, engine bearing. Um, this is how you get the uh, lubrication forces um, created. Um, it's called uh, hydrodynamic lubrication. Um, so typically we measure from the oil hole across. Typically we get about four thou. Um, you can get anywhere from three to five thou of eccentricity. When you're measuring your bearing eccentricity, um, typically four to five thou, you can see anywhere from three to five thou. Uh, anywhere in that range is a good healthy margin and the engine will live. You're gonna wanna make sure your primary engine oil clearance is good. Uh, typically for us, for an engine of uh, this caliber, uh, because the dimensions of the crankshaft are so good, um, the two thou to two and a half thou is it's going to live nicely. Uh, we won't see any issues with that. Um, typically, some engine builders will take a little bit further, go three and a half thou. Um, but if I have a crankshaft that is good, um, straight, and has a, a good dimension, less than two ten thousandths of an inch, uh, I always go ahead and try to build the engine a little bit tighter. All right, so a couple things to touch on now that we've checked our oil clearances. Um, for this engine, um, we're gonna be running the 2000 oil clearance on the main bearing. Um, an industry standard, uh, just so um, people know, um, usually it's about 1000 per inch of uh, journal um, diameter. So you'll measure this, 1000 times whatever the journal diameter of this, approximately what the oil clearance would be for the standard um, engine. The uh, application will kind of decide the oil clearance you want to run. Uh, for a higher performance engine, usually people want to run a little bit of a larger oil clearance. Um, things are moving around a lot. Um, if you have uh, a little bit more of an unacceptable dimension on your crankshaft, you probably want to want run a little more oil clearance because it's just not going to be that dimension the entire time it's running. It's going to, you know, taper out of round has a, a large effect. Um, the oil clearance will have a great effect on uh, oil temperature. Um, the tighter the uh, oil clearance is, um, usually the higher the oil temperatures you'll have. So you usually you combat that with running thinner oil. Um, if you have a larger oil clearance, usually oil temperatures are lower, but you have to run a thicker oil. Um, so a couple of things to keep in mind when you're selecting your uh, bearing clearances, the type of oil you want to run is affected by that greatly. So for an engine like this, uh, it is going to be a street engine. Um, so we are trying to run the engine uh, oil clearances as tight as possible. Um, this allows, allows for a very long life engine. Um, you get longevity out of an engine that has a tighter clearance. Um, for his application, um, he's looking to go for uh, not too much power, but he's still trying to make more power than stock. Um, he's looking for about six to 800 horsepower which in that range, uh, 2000 oil clearance is more than enough to let it live um, and also give it a long life. Um, on some RBs I have in the past, uh, run the engines down to a half a thou of oil clearance. Uh, when your dimensions are perfect, it's a stock engine, you can run them extremely tight and have great success. Uh, the, uh, the limiting factor again is the oil you're running in that engine. You cannot run a thicker oil, it will get too hot and the oil will break down too quickly. Um, obviously that has some other variables involved if you're running an oil that is too thick for the engine but you have an oil cooler to bring the temperatures down to control that, that is okay. Obviously it's all taken with a grain of salt. Uh, different experiences with different engines will obviously play a part in what you are going to do with your setup. Um, but in our experience, uh, you always want to run as tight as possible for the application you're gonna be running. If this engine was running like a thousand horsepower plus, we would discuss uh, larger oil clearances. Again, that's usually just to combat the fact that things are flexing and moving. It might look like a solid chunk of metal, um, but when you're putting power through these things, uh, it does flex and move around. Um, the crankshaft does flex and move around. So that's why you need that oil clearance to kind of take up that um, 
extra bit of movement in there. Um, if it is uh, dimensionally sound and the, the journals are perfectly round and the oil clearance is uh, set to match your, your um, application, you should have no issues. So now that we've got our, uh, our uh, oil clearances set, uh, we've verified uh, the oil clearance, we've verified the eccentricity, uh, we've verified the main journals on the crankshaft are round. Um, there's no major taper or out of round. Uh, we're within one tenth on the crankshaft, so that is very, very good. And uh, we're going to go ahead, we're going to take off the brace, we're going to take off the girdle, we're going to set that aside, we're going to check the crank for straightness, we're going to check the journals for the rods, um, and then we're going to clean everything, and then get the crank into the block, and we'll uh, carry on with the rest. <laughs>